So this is section 5.4, indefinite intervals and the net change theorem. I'm just going to call it 5.4, indefinite intervals. That's the big piece of it. So like I said just a minute ago, when we have A and B and some function here, if this is continuous from A to B, right, we can get some function out, which we then evaluate at B and evaluate at A, and that tells us the area. But now there's this question of, this is dependent on A and B, what if I just get rid of those? So what do we have over here now? What are you evaluating at here? What are you evaluating at here? So let's just figure that out. We'll try and take an indefinite integral and area of some function to give us another function. And this other function is going to be the guy that can just tell us any area. Now, as a review, if I write this down, what is the relationship, mathematical relationship, okay, between F little and F big? Well, F big is the antiderivative of F little. It is. What does that mean? Very good. Antiderivative mean. And I'm going to rewrite your phrase there. And antiderivative of f, right? Yep. Okay. That's perfect. Like these are the exact words. So you're 100 percent right. For everyone else's sake, what does that mean? If I take the derivative of this guy, what do I get? This guy. Okay, so what, what should we do for, for retitling this section? Forget the word indefinite integral phrase, and we're just going to talk about antiderivatives again, because that's what we're doing. Okay, but the integral has this connotation, this idea that we're computing areas, whereas the antiderivative has this connotation that there's a derivative we're taking. An integral adds up. A derivative does no such thing. Right. An antiderivative is, in a sense, the inverse to something which is a limit. And it's not even like a product of a height and a width function, which we have with integrals. So this is a perfect response. F is an antiderivative of F. Perfect. AKA, if we ever take that derivative, we get that. And you know lots of these. So let's make a quick table. Derivative practice and good antiderivative or indefinite integral practice. So let's go with um, integral of f of x dx. Um, let's go with f of x here and we'll do the integral of f of x dx over here. So if I give you a function, and you attempt to integrate it, what do you get? One.
I think it was office hours yesterday or two days ago that this question came up and the student had no idea. So I, I proposed this suggestion. We're trying to find this. Let's think about what it is. What does this big S stand for? It stands for adding up all the pieces of this. That's what we're doing. We're doing a big sum, right? We're adding up all the pieces. For this integral, we're adding up these things, pieces. These are the pieces. One is just a number, so we're adding up one of the dx's. So we're really adding up all these dx's. What is dx? Well, from the sum, you remember dx is the result of the delta x, like an interval of the x-axis, but it's going to a very, really, really small amount. It's becoming an infinitely short subinterval on the x-axis. So this is like adding up a little bit of x. And how many of them are we adding up? We're adding up all of the pieces of x. dx is a piece of x. So if we want to add up all, just one each, all the little pieces of x, we're going to get x back. Make sense? Take the x-axis, split it up into delta x intervals, and then add them all up. What are you going to get? All the ad intervals added up, which is your initial interval, 0 to x. So the indefinite integral of this is just that, x plus a constant. Okay, that I hope makes some like I hope that puts some intuition behind integrals and what you're doing. You're adding up a bunch of pieces. And what you're adding up the pieces of are right here. So what if each piece I then scale? I make it a little bigger or smaller. I take a number k, I multiply it by each little piece of x dx. What's the antiderivative of just the constant k? Yeah. yeah. So for every little piece, I multiply it by k. So I've got this big sum of little pieces of x. Each of them is scaled by k. So if I add them up, I'm definitely going to get k times x. Definitely. Without the k, I add up all the pieces of x and I get x. With the k, I recover the x again, but now I've scaled them all by k, plus some constant. And now it gets more complicated, right? Now, instead of multiplying by a, a, a number that doesn't change, we're going to multiply by a function that weights each of these little pieces of x before we add them up. And this is where your knowledge of derivatives really comes into play. We know this one, the antiderivative of x to any power n, except negative 1, is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1. Over? n plus 1. Perfect. So either this, that's great, it's a succinct way of writing it, or times 1 over n plus 1, both are great, they're the same, perfect. What is the special case where x is negative 1?
Master log of that. Yes. Okay. E to the x. E to the x plus c. That's the one that never changes. You add up all the pieces of dx, weighted by e to the x, you get e to the x. What are some of the ones we got here? Oh, we saw the one that uh, we wrote right away at the beginning. Secant squared of x, cosine x, negative sine x, we saw a tangent of x. Sine of x at one point in time. We saw cosine of x. We saw this one in an example earlier this year. I see they're getting more and more wild the further I get to the right of the board. Sorry about that. What else do we see? I, I, I don't like this table, but it's, it's only because they have so many things on it. Uh, this is a good time for me to bring in something that I study. You know, hyperbolic geometry stuff. You heard of hyperbolic geometry, hyperbolic surfaces? OK, never mind. Oh, I'm going to write it down anyway. That's the hyperbolic sign some function defined in terms of exponential functions, but it's called the hyperbolic sine. It's one of my favorite because you pronounce it shine. Like when you see that, you say shine. Anyway, that's just a fun little piece. If you had a guess, based on stuff that's written up here, what's the antiderivative of that? Probably the cosine or the negative cosine, but the hyperbolic version. And you'd be correct. That's pronounced kosh. So shine has the antiderivative of kosh. Kosh has the antiderivative of shine. No negatives. It just switches. Not like the original sine and cosine. Uh, so that's things that you know we haven't even looked at before, but are definitely things that um, you could look at. How about this one? This is something you've seen before. What's the indefinite integral of cosecant squared? We had secant squared up there. Cotangent. Cotangent. this section we're thinking about, is there a function, right, is there a function, capital S, such that it can just tell me the area underneath this function, right? And these antiderivatives in this table are functions which enable us to find the area underneath that curve, a given curve, for any interval a to b. So this brings me to, um, I mean, really just more things that we've talked about before. So let's compute some definite integrals. Let's compute some indefinite integrals. And I'll give you a name for what we call one of them. So let's see if we can do this one. 0 over 2. Uh, and I'm going to. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it this way. So we'll start with the definite integral. 2x cubed minus 6x plus 3 over 1 plus x squared dx.
whenever you are, are given some integral, right, the immediate question is, really it's not, I'm going to start writing that sum down. Your immediate go-to should be, do I know any indefinite integrals for what's written there? Okay? It's like that's because if, if there is, that's the one stop. Just spits out the area to you. Okay? So you're always trying to think this question. Right? Given what's written inside the integral, that's called the integrand. Is it somewhere on that list, or can I build it from that list? And there's this nice property of integrals that I think at some point we talked about, maybe even in section two or section one. If you have an integral from A to B of f of x plus or minus g of x, then this is the same as two integrals. The integral of the first piece plus or minus the integral of the second piece. This property basically says if you've got a sum or difference inside here, then you really just need to ask yourself about antiderivatives of each piece in the sum or difference, which is great. means I can just go piece, I mean term by term, and ask, is it somewhere on this list? And then I can just fill in what's on the other end of the list. So this, I see 2x cubed. That's something like this, because n's not 1, a negative 1. So what do I do? I add 1, divide by the new power. So this thing, becomes x to the fourth times 2 divided by the new power 4. That's the indefinite integral if I take away those limits of the first term in here. We do the same thing for minus 6x dx. Is the power here a negative 1? No, it's x to the first. So we apply the same rule. This is 6x squared divided by the new power 2. And then I'm out of room. We'll uh, handle these two first. I think I remember last time also saying once we find that, we need to evaluate it at the endpoints, 2 and 0. Now, like I said, we're not done. There's three things here, three terms. I've only done the first two and split them up into separate integrals, which we can then add together. So I'm going to erase the blue and put the third integral up here, and we'll write that one down. Okay. x squared, where we're just multiplying 3 by the 1 over 1 plus x squared, right? Does that change things? I wrote this property down a couple days ago, too, or last week or two weeks ago before break, so it was a while ago. There's another rule, right? If you think about adding up things, let's say 1 plus 2 plus 3, if I multiply that by some number, say 3, you can distribute through the sum, right? 
Okay, what's an integral? It's a big sum. It's a sum of things that look like this and are multiplied by a delta x. So every one of these guys has a factor of 3 on top. So in the big sum that we're doing, how about we just factor out that 3? Right? Factor out 3. Add all the things up, and then in the end multiply by 3. That's what this is, right? First, I add everything up. The thing that I know about, the triangular numbers here. I add them up, then I multiply them by 3. That's no different than adding up all the multiples of 3 of the triangular numbers. So we can do this. Now this looks exactly like that over there. So this is just 3 times the indefinite integral for 1 over 1 plus x squared, which is inverse tangent. And that's evaluated from 0 to 2. So like I said, the very, very, very first thing that you do when you're given some definite integral is you think of it piece by piece. Do I know the indefinite integral for this? And for this, and for this, I look at each term and see if it's somewhere on my list that's written down somewhere or if it's maybe on the back of my eyelids, somewhere. And if you know all of those little indefinite integrals, well then you just go right ahead and you've got them. Okay. Now any calculator will just plug these in and tell you what the numbers are. Inverse tangent of 2, inverse tangent of 0, multiply those by 3, take the difference. Plug in 2, plug in 0, take the difference. Plug in 2, plug in 0, take the difference. But we need to be a little more cautious. Right? Can you always just plug it in and go? Okay, you're absolutely thinking in the right direction. We need to be worrying about continuity, but you're not worried about the indefinite integral's continuity. You're worried about tangent inverse being continuous. It is, but that's not the one we care about. We need to care about what we're taking the integral of. That Thing is what defines the area. The 1 over 1 plus x squared, that's the height, which we're multiplying by some width dx. If the height goes to infinity, if we've got some asymptote in there, and we've got a discontinuity for that 1 over 1 plus x squared, we start adding up infinities and things start breaking down really fast. They fall apart quickly. They should totally remake that movie, Things Fall Apart but like in terms of like a math movie. It'd be so funny. Nice parody. Anyway. Um, yeah, we need to worry about if this guy is continuous. And specifically, is it continuous between these two values? Is there a discontinuity in this guy? Is there ever division by zero? I see varying responses. There should be a definite yes. You are dividing by zero somewhere but not in between the real numbers 0 and 2. That's why most of you are saying no. So, continuous, from here to here, perfect. We use this, plug in the numbers and go, 
Continuous between 0 and 2? Polynomial, 2x cubed. Polynomials are continuous everywhere, so find the indefinite, plug and go. Continuous? Yeah, 6x is a line, that's continuous everywhere. So plug in 2 and 0 to the indefinite integral, and you're good. Just keep going. Okay? So, sort of algorithmically, definite integral, term by term, check for indefinite integrals. Write down the sum or difference of them. Evaluate them at the endpoints and find differences if and only if these guys are continuous on those intervals. If they're not, you're in the situation we were at at the very beginning of the class. Break it into small subintervals. Take limits if you need to. And just pray. squared times square root of t. like the next level of difficulty. How many terms technically are there right now for this function? I said the first step is you go term by term, piece by piece, and you ask what's the indefinite integral, right? How many pieces are there right now? Draw your fingers down but one. You've got one quotient there, don't we? Oof. One quotient. A bunch of stuff divided by t squared. So one level of difficulty higher, that's what this is. Can we turn this into something with more pieces that we can then take indefinite integrals of? Can we leverage algebra to put this in a form that looks like something like that? Because as it stands, this looks nothing like any of those. So sidebar. If I give you three numbers, and I divide them all by one number, there's two ways you can go about finding this result. One plus two plus three is six. Divide by four, this is three halves. Or, there's another way. You break it into three separate fractions. One fourth plus two fourths plus three fourths. And all that's six fourths, which is three halves. It's the same thing, right? No matter what numbers I give you, aka, no matter what t I give you, you can take this fraction with one, two, three numbers added together on top, divided by one, and rewrite it as three fractions. This over that, plus this over that, minus this over that. This is the perfect opportunity for you to inspect and see, hey, are, are each of these continuous from 1 to 9?
2 t squared divided by t squared. That's the same as 2 if you remove the removable discontinuity at 0. Right? Sure. You can't divide. If I plug in 0 to this, what do you get? You get 0 over 0. As it is, that's not allowed because you can't divide 0 by 0 unless you're taking some log Paul's rule problem and you're going with it, right? That discontinuity is at zero. Is zero in this interval? No. So who cares? Cancel the t's. Bingo. Continuous, one to nine, two, dt. Continuous from one to nine? Well, again, we can't plug in negatives, but there's no negatives. We can't plug in zero, but zero is outside of one to nine. So cancel these two t's. And find that. Last term. Can't divide by zero, and there's no other issues. But zero is not in here, from one to nine. So this is just what it is. Now are those over there? The indefinite integral of any constant of 2 is the constant times x. This is 2, our variable is t, just to remind us of that. 2t evaluated from 1 to 9. What's this one? I don't see any roots over there. Or do I? Nikaya, what are you offering? I'm not laughing. Do you have it? I want to say something, but I don't know. What to Please say it, and then Fred will correct you. OK. Um, so can you do t to the 1 half? I mean, so long as it's not negative. Is one half negative? No. No. We're good. N is one half. Okay? So we add one to one half. Three halves. We divide by the new power. Division by a fraction is the same as multiplication by its reciprocal. Evaluated from one to nine. Oh boy, more problems. Nikaya, you are our expert on that. So, you got. You're our expert on seeing it differently. So. C, 1 over t squared differently, go! <laughs> no pressure. No pressure, but we're, we're, we do need to go faster, so. Oh. No, just kidding. Just, all right, here we go. What is it? Anyone at this point. 1 over t squared. What's another way of thinking about that? Yes, perfect. t to the negative 2. Yeah. Like, that's, the, that's one of those rules of, of powers. If I've got... 2 to the negative third, that's the same as 1 over 2 to the positive third. Right? You can always like take the reciprocal of a number and just add a negative 1 in its power. We had this, uh, this one here, x to the negative 1 means just the reciprocal of x. If you've got like a negative 2 here, what it means is Five squared, it's reciprocal. That's one over five squared. So for this, 
It's just p to the negative 2. Is negative 2 negative 1? No. So just apply this. Negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1. Divide by the new power. Division by negative 1 is multiplication by negative 1, which cancels this negative sign out. Evaluate it from 1 to 9. And we're good. We just. 2 times 9 minus 2 times 1 plus 2 thirds times 9 to the 3 halves minus 2 thirds times 1 to the 3 halves plus 9 to the negative first minus 1 to the negative first. That's just a number. Okay. Questions about evaluating definite integrals by rethinking them in terms of indefinite integrals. Yes? Can we leave it like that? Or do you want to That's perfect for me. Okay. Yeah. In fact, at this point, I can see exactly what you've done. If you throw that into a calculator and give me some number which is incorrect, I have no idea if you did the right thing or not. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. So seeing this is like, yeah, you got it. Seeing the wrong number is like, I don't know if you've got fat fingers or if you did it wrong. <laughs> okay. P-H-A-T fingers. Cool fingers. Sorry. We've got 20 minutes. Do a couple more? Okay. As I erase, what's the first thing you ask yourself about what's inside the integral? Tell your neighbor. What's the first thing you would check about it? I wrote f of x, a to b, what's the first thing you ask about that function? Yeah, you'd ask if it was continuous between a and b, because if it is, just ask for the antiderivative next, right? And then you're done. Okay, if it's not continuous, tell your neighbor, what would you do? <laughs> yeah, I saw I heard a lot of people say it. I'm just going to split this up. If it's discontinuous at C, then you do A to C f of x dx plus C to B f of x dx. Perfect. What if it's got a vertical asymptote at C? Yeah, you've got to perform that like that magic stuff with like minus a little t plus a little t and let the limit as t goes to nothing happen of this whole thing. But if it's not like that, then the game is much easier. You might still need to do this, but the game is much easier. step function takes height 1 from 0 to 1 and then height 2 from, well, not exactly at 1, but close, from 1 to 2. This is my function f. Okay? 
step function. What's the integral of f of x from 0 to 2? That's discontinuous at 1, right? Okay, pump the brakes, break it up. 0 to 1, f of x, plus 1 to 2, f of x dx. Okay? Is our function continuous from 0 to 1? Yeah, actually. It goes all the way to the axis and it goes to 1. So the function there is a height of 1, right? So this is x evaluated at 1 and 0 and then find the difference. Is this guy continuous from 1 to 2? Yes. No. Everywhere except 1. It's got a hole there. Oh, yeah. So how do you do that? plus a little t, at the limit as t goes to 0. Okay, now, from 1 plus a little bit, so we're not right here, we're a little bit to the right, what's the function value? 2. So in here, in this 1 plus t to 2, the function is continuous and it's exactly the function of 2. Right? Fantastic. What do you get here? You get uh, 2x from 1 plus t up to 2. And then you take the limit as t goes to nothing. Right? Plug in 2, you get 4. Plug in 1 plus t, you get 2 plus 2t. Two which when you take the limit as t goes to zero just kills that second term. And what do you get? You get this area, which is a square of one in size, plus this area, which is a rectangle, exactly two in size. So you get three for all this. One minus zero, one. plus 2 minus 2 plus 0. 2 minus 2 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. That's what you got. Step functions are obnoxious. They're everywhere. You can't go to any store without dealing with step functions. You can't purchase anything without dealing with step functions. If you want to add up how much money you spend, you have to take integrals of step functions. We're going to say your seat printer is so good at those things. So good. Because it's adding up all those step function totals, right? That's what it does. Alrighty, what do we call these things? Well, we call these things, in other words, net changes. What we've been talking about, these integrals. What are we thinking about in terms of changing, though, is a good question. Hmm. So we know integral f of x dx equals some other function, which tells us the area. Right? How is this a net change? Well, what if I said this thing is a derivative? Then there is something changing. In fact, the derivative is telling you how fast it's changing. Right? So if I told you how fast something was changing, the derivative of it, 
and then you've added up all those changes, what are you telling me? You're telling me net change. Right? That, that, is that clear? Okay, and this is called the net change theorem. Net change theorem says if f prime of x is the derivative of some f, and you integrate it from a to b, then this is, of course, f of b minus f of a, and this, or since it's equal to this, these are called the net change. Pictorially, f prime is the slope. So it tells you over a little interval how far up or down the function goes. So if I cut out a little delta x, and I tell you the average slope from that right-hand endpoint to the left-hand endpoint, if I tell you the average slope there, m, then the change in height from here to here is approximately m times delta x. In fact, if that is the average slope, then that's exactly that. That's all we're talking about here. The slope of a function times a little interval in x that tells you the net change in f from a to b, from the left end point of this to the right end point of this. If you add all those up from a to b, you get the net change in the function height. This goes by other names in other contexts. Any of you in economics classes? Yeah, what do you call net change of some function, like a cost function or a profits function, something like this? In fact, these things are net changes. A loss function more or less tells you, here's what we're at now, here's what we were at before. The difference is how much we've lost. A revenue function is, here's how much we have now, here's how much we had back then. The net change is how much revenue we have. Cost minus profits, or profits minus cost, whatever it is. I'm not an economist, so I don't know the right words for this. In physics, we talk about energy changes all the time. You know, So this is a net change in energy. But you can think about adding up how quickly the energy is changing in some system. Here's how it is at the end, here's how it is at the beginning. The difference is the change in energy. Okay? So net change, it's like this phrase I throw at you here at the end of this section. It's like what a non-mathematician sees and they're like, I can use that. Whereas a mathematician's like, duh, so it's like the fundamental theorem of calculus. So it takes lots of names in lots of different contexts. But the net change theorem says for a function which is continuous and is thought of as the derivative of some other function, the integral tells you the net change of that original function. Um, just a few things here. Uh, the examples they go through, and there's it's ridiculous how many they have here, they say you could talk about volumes of water. So they give an example of, if you know how fast the volume is changing, you can then tell, you know, tell me from time one to time two how much volume has lost, or been lost, or been gained. The next example was, what about concentrations of chemical, uh, chemicals in some reaction? Then the rate of change of the concentrations can be used to find the net change and they go into how much mass is in some, some body and how quickly that mass is changing. They say the road, rate of growth of the population, we've studied stuff like that before, they keep going for three or four more. We have 10 minutes, how did that take 10 minutes all of that? Like, I'm not talking now. That's basically it um, for these, for this section.
a la carte. What do you want? Example problems? More indefinite integrals? More definite integrals? Other sections? A nap? <laughs> Some of you are already taking that, or just did. Indefinite? Here we go. Cosecant t, cotangent t. So don't confuse this t with that t. From pi over 6 to pi over 2. How many terms? Terms are split up with pluses and minuses. So there's one term. There's no pluses and minuses. Okay. I erased the list. Was this on the list anyway? No, it wasn't. <laughs> Sorry. This is the product of cosecant times cotangent. So now the question is, First, is it continuous from pi over 6 to pi over 2? And second, do you know the antiderivative of that? Something which when you take the derivative, you get that. So first, continuous. Is cosecant continuous from pi over 6 to pi over 2? Cosecant is 1 over sine. Pi over 6 is here. Pi over 2 is here. This angle in here. sine ever zero for those angles. No. So this never has a discontinuity in it. How about this factor? It's cotangent. Cotangent is cosine over sine. Is that ever discontinuous from this angle to this angle? Cosine starts at root 3 over 2 and goes up to 0. Well, down to 0, I guess. So this thing can be 0 on top. What about on bottom? Sine starts at 1 half and goes up to 1. And it never hits the x-axis. So this is never 0 on bottom. So this is well defined. It's not infinity. It's not division by zero from pi over six to pi over two. Neither is this. This is continuous on this interval. So find me a function that when we take the derivative, oops, you get this. really asking because I really have no idea. Actually, I do, but it takes me some time to work it out. I'm hoping 40 of you can work it out faster. Take the derivative of secant. Secant is 1 over cosine, right? Great. 
Really? Why am I asking you to take derivatives of secant? First of all, if you're looking for an antiderivative, you can also look for derivatives. These are trig functions, and that's a cosecant. So I'm thinking maybe a secant turns into a cosecant somewhere, because sines turn into cosines and cosines turn into sines. So I'm randomly guessing, let's pick secant, take its derivative, and if we get this, then we know exactly what it is. So let's do that. Quotient rule, right? Derivative of the top times the bottom. Minus top times the derivative of the bottom. All over the bottom squared. This is sine t over cosine squared t. Which is not cotangent times cosecant. This is tangent. sine over one of these cosines times one over the other cosine. Shoot, missed it. But that gives you a really good indication of what it should be, right? What is it? Cosecant. Let's try that one. Cosecant is one over sine. Quotient rule, derivative of the top times the bottom, minus the top times the derivative of the bottom, divided by the bottom squared. Zero minus cosine t. This is minus cosine t over one of the sines, times one over the other sign. And that is the opposite of this. The negative of this, which is fantastic. If instead of starting with cosecant, we start with negative cosecant, derivatives don't care about negatives. You can factor them out, right? And that puts a negative sign here, and puts a negative sign here, and puts a negative sign here, which cancels back, and we get cotangent times cosecant, which is what we need. So what is f of x is negative cosecant of t. When you take the antiderivative of this, you get exactly that. Because the derivative of this is exactly that. Yes. And now you just plug in these two angles, take the difference, and you're done. So that's like a really valid way of doing this. Really valid. If you don't know an antiderivative, ask yourself derivatives. Those are mechanical. Those you use a rule for every time. If you can get something like this, then you're good. If not, move on. <laughs> Have a great day. I'll see you Friday. Thank you.